Our three-day exploration of the Buren Peninsula took us around the Heritage Drive, past oldest Newfoundland in both cultural and geological senses, but the newest part for us. We began on Canada Day with a tour of the Marystown area, known originally for fishing but now a shipbuilding and drill rig maintenance area. From dories to drill rigs is the tagline at the local tourist information interpretive sign. The Henry Goodrich semi-submersible rig <clears throat> speaks to the modern era. The area has lots of beautiful wildflowers, starting with the many shades of pink, blue, and white lupins that line the highways along the Heritage Drive. Our B&B was just up the road from Rock Harbor an outport that characterizes the Dory's area, era with old but still working stages in place. St. Luke's Anglican Church is characteristic of many of the old churches that we saw during this trip. Just up the road is Cashel's Corner, a fantastic craft store operated by Irene Hurley. The Medusa-style driftwood in her garden caught Don's eye. The Buren Bay Arm consists of the village of Buren and several smaller outports. Names like Tides Point, Porto Braa, Black Duck Cove, and Mortier are testament to the mixed cultural heritage. Captain Cook mapped the coast in the late 1700s. We hiked part of the trail towards Cook's Lookout, but instead got sidetracked by more spectacular wildflowers. There were yellow pond lilies, Labrador tea, pitcher plants, orchids, and others, including this small spruce dripping from the overnight rain in a most artistic manner. The history of the Spurrier Company involved successful commerce for several generations until 1830. Local stages are living history with their boats and lobster traps pursuing an active fishery. In 1929, the area was devastated by a tsunami-sized tidal wave which wreaked havoc and took many lives. The local cemetery indicates that the sea has always taken its toll of young men. Near the town of St. Lawrence is Chamber Bay, where the USS Truxton and Pollocks met their fate in December 1942. 110 sailors lost their lives, <clears throat> but thanks to the historic and persistent efforts of the local people, 46 men were saved. An incredible feat, considering the cliffs and the winter weather. The town of Grand Bank is full of history, being home to several large merchants' or captains' houses from a bygone era. The Fidelity Lodge is also a survivor. The So and So store speaks to the pastimes of the current residents. And the modern Siemens Museum, not yet reopened after a devastating fire, is iconic. The Harris family was very prominent in Grand Bank's fishery, commerce, and society for many years from the late 1800s to the middle 1900s. The pool in the Siemens Memorial Garden has a nameplate for each of the 155 locals who have been lost at sea over the years. The bronze casting of the woman on the widow's walk is mute testimony to the weight endured by their wives. The bait depot was an interesting old building, as was the forward and Thibault warehouse. Their 1947 calendar states, Tin Salmon and Lobster a Specialty. Then on to Fortune Head, an ecological reserve that is home to 543 million year old fossils. They mark the divide between the Precambrian and Cambrian geological eras, similar to the mistaken point deposits on the Avalon Peninsula. As we left the Buren Peninsula, we visited the fishing villages of Red Bay Harbor, St. Bernard's, and Harbor Mill. Each outport has its own charm built on location and history that goes back 200 years or more. The Buren Peninsula added several light stations to our collection.
These light stations included the one at Grand Banks, Fortune Head, and Lameline. Since a foghorn is the primary device today to warn seafarers of pending danger, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans has designated many lighthouses as surplus property and for sale. The purchasers will have to maintain them as heritage properties.